starting here. Uh, welcome to the Fortifier Data Podcast. I'm here with Chris Arminio. Um, so we're just jumping right into this. We both kind of walked in just now. <laughs> like actually, uh, he got here. I was here just maybe 10 minutes before him. But um, So I originally met Chris through Adam Gall, who's probably the most uh, shouted out person on this podcast right now. So shout out to Adam Gall. Uh, now you worked with him at DXY at, at one point, correct? I did, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you were recommended to me as a guy that was in the startup scene, as a guy that was focused on a lot of IoT projects, that's doing a lot of interesting things. You know, I met with him. I ver could verify he's working on a very many, you know, interesting things. Uh, so want to have him on the podcast. So I'm going to let you kind of give us the rundown of how you got into IT and kind of what led you to where you're at now. Sure. Um, I mean, to start with, I was doing like defense robotics uh, down in Pittsburgh for a while, and then. Um, Right about the time that IoT kind of started getting big around 2010, 2011, um, started kind of uh, playing around in that area. And uh, what brought us back originally was an opportunity with, uh, with Launch House to be part of their accelerator. And that was kind of my first company in the IoT space. Um, that was IOTOS. Um, that uh, didn't work out as, mm -hmm. uh, as most startup companies do, and that's completely fine. Um, <laughs> you, have to, you have to learn lessons, and you learn the most lessons from sure. failure. So. So from there, um, the nice part about that was that I uh, had become familiar with DXY, and uh, when I left that, when I left uh, IOTOS, went over to DXY, and I got to meet just a ton of great people over there. They had um, a really great talent pool over there, um, Adam Gall being one of them. Um, and then from there, uh, kind of on the side, I started playing around with uh, IoT as it relates to the beer and beverage industry. Sure. And that's kind of where I am today. Um, working for, or I guess, you know, part owner of Breakwall Analytics, uh, and we focus mostly on um, IoT or industrial IoT as it applies to the beer and beverage industry, and that's mostly because one of our um, co-founders is also uh, owner of Platform Brewery, so um, essentially there's a little bit of cross, there's a lot of cross, yeah, uh, yeah. cross pollination there. We're sure. kind of like the R&D arm of Platform okay. Brewery. Okay, yeah, and just to touch on mm -hmm. a, a point that you had made, I guess, so in the startup scene, you know, you talked about having some like lessons. What are some of like the, the key takeaway lessons that you had from from that startup experience? Um, I mean, the, the key lessons, I think, are uh, there's a lot of companies out there that um, you know, want to, I guess, kind of help you um, with your startup. Um, and uh, you, you need to be you need to be wary of guess, everyone's kind of intentions and what their incentives are. Sure, um, sure. So, for example, a lot of accelerators, um, you know, if they're using state funds and they have some sort of metric that says, okay, uh, how many of these uh, companies are actually successful? One of those being, did they get follow-on funding? So they're kind of in a spot where they don't really care where the money comes from. They just want to see um, money come into some of their accelerator companies. Um, and so you you run into some um, you run into some issues. Um, and that's that's fine. That's part of the whole the whole game, right? The whole yeah, startup yeah. game. Um, and I think that's I think that was the, the biggest um, thing that kind of came by me. I was very focused on the technical aspect of all of that, mm -hmm. and didn't spend a whole time a whole lot of time kind of looking at the non technical business finance aspects. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, that's it's always uh, it's always interesting to hear from. Uh, people that just recently got out of their first startup or maybe had tales from their first startup versus somebody that just started their first startup and is just interacting with a, that accelerator or starting to understand what like venture capital funding is, things like that, and they're really bright-eyed and bushy-tailed generally. Yep, yep. And it's funny because everyone walking out of it is just a little jaded. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. And that's why you know, one of the choices that we've made is that we, we try to kind of self-fund as yeah. much as possible. So we do some side contracting that pays all of our bills so that we can kind of yeah. do our own startup thing. And now that startup, Breakwall Analytics, you yes. are the CTO, co-founder. Correct. Um, how, how, how do you, like, so give us kind of a deeper dive into what you guys are doing over there. Um, sure. So... Uh, our core technology is around the beer and beverage industry. So uh, one of our founders, um, Justin, he owns Platform. He also owns a beer line cleaning industry, or I'm sorry, beer line cleaning company. Sure. Um, so one of the things they do is they service beer lines in bars, restaurants, things like that. And uh, one of the issues they ran into is that, um, you know, 
bartender uh, starts pouring foamy beer and they don't know why and so they go into the back and start cranking on pressure regulators and things like that um, trying to fix it and then that just kind of makes the problem worse and so we found out that we could instrument just a very small um, number of metrics in the cooler things like temperature co2 pressure um, and we can essentially remotely diagnose problems um, without having to send a technician out there mm -hmm. and so you know that company is in seven states um, something like 3,000 customers right so uh, if you can service uh, more locations with uh, less technicians that's great um, that's great for the company um, and it's also great for the technicians because now you can kind of really focus on your really skilled really quality workers um, rather than having to you know have a huge workforce sure that makes sense yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so in this, you're supplying the sensor, right? Correct. And then you're, you're supplying the software? Correct. And uh, how are those things different? Because I know they are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we take a lot of pride in is that uh, we do pretty much everything. So uh, we develop the electronics, the PCBs, we write the firmware for it, we write kind of our, we design the architecture for how those communicate with different gateway devices, all that goes up to the cloud. Um, they're just different skill sets. I think that nowadays, you know, if you look at resumes and things like that, um, people talk about being a full stack engineer. Um, and I think that just coming from more on the embedded side sure, of things, sure. um, I think that uh, what people think of as a full stack engineer isn't necessarily a full stack engineer until you actually extend that stack down into hardware. Okay. Um, because nowadays, I mean, uh, look at all of your different, you know, IoT, consumer IoT devices out there. Um, it's not like they're just sitting out by themselves, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They need to interact with cloud services and um, different mechanisms like that. And so, you, as a full stack engineer, you need to understand what's going on in the hardware mm -hmm. and you need to understand what's going on in the cloud. Everything yeah. kind of in between. Sure. And, you know, IoT is maybe not the hottest buzzword anymore. True. But five years ago, I think it almost certainly was, at mm -hmm. least in, in our tech space, uh, a lot of projects I found were almost, yeah, they were, they were kind of short-sighted, where they were like, we have this widget, we have this, you know, it's going to feed into this program, you know, I paid my cousin to make the program, it's out <laughs> there, right? And, and so, uh, you know, I, I benefited from that because people needed to add a cybersecurity layer to it, or just a security layer to it, I wouldn't even call it, you know, anything sophisticated, but... Um, are you still seeing that with when you're talking to kind of contemporaries, you're seeing other projects where they're just kind of throwing out the project without necessarily baking the whole thing into it? Um, and you can pick on cybersecurity, uh, you know, particularly. Sure. If any of these things are feeding into. Um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of, the right, same when kind of the mobile apps became popular, right? There's a lot of people going out there and just trying to get something to market without thinking about the security aspects. And I think that's important because anytime you start having a um, device on your on a network, on a customer's network in you know, thousands of locations, uh, that device becomes kind of a point of entry for uh, security attacks. Um, so, but I, I think, you know, you mentioned cybersecurity also, you know, behind your head you also have AI, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think that that's also kind of an interesting kind of uh, intersection. Yeah. Um, I think what you're seeing in the IoT industry is kind of uh, a focus on um, kind of meshing IoT, or at least industrial IoT, with AI to kind of get a better idea of uh, the operation of systems and um, try to find cost savings for customers. That makes okay. sense. Um, and with your, I mean, with your software component, you have some flavor of uh, predictive analytics, right? To to kind of tell you, hey, your your uh, was it would a beer line needs to be cleaned? Is that how you describe it? Um, essentially, we're looking at kind of a, a couple different things, but yeah. looking at like essentially beer line health. Sure. Um, you know, like a little health meter that goes down every time you lose a point. Well, there's a there's a lot of stuff <laughs> that plays into it, like cooler temperature. Yeah. Is your cooler um, at an appropriate temperature? Is your sure. glycol unit that keeps your beer cold from the cooler to the actual tap is that operating correctly? Um, and you have CO two or your CO two pressures uh, within an acceptable range. But um, yeah, I, I, so we're looking at kind of all of those kind of at the at the same time to get that kind of health metric. Yeah, um, and I think as you mentioned, like predictive analytics, um, 
Purdue's analytics, but also kind of machine learning are kind of the, um, I guess, uh, buzzwords now. I didn't know some, some buzzwords sure, nowadays. Sure. Well, AI has been smashed into like deep learning, machine learning, general AI, things like that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of still under that umbrella, but there's definitely, the deeper you get into it, uh, you'll have people that are like, I just do machine learning. Correct. I just do this. And, and then it can get even more granular where they're like, listen, I do this flavor of machine learning. Don't talk to me about anything else. Yep. You know, and I, and I, I tend to appreciate that because then they're really focused on what they're doing. Uh, yeah, I was actually at a, uh, I was at a conference on VR and there's a VR guy kind of talking about AI and he's like, yeah, you know, we're, we're implementing a lot of general AI in our VR. I'm like, really? Because... That, that term might not mean what you think it does, right? right? You know, because in a lot of terms, general AI is, is the broad scope of AI teaching AI how to AI. Right. Right. And that's like... And your adversarial neural networks and things like that. Yeah, which is just not where we're at. Right. Right. So, and, and obviously, you know, he was a VR guy. I kind of knew where he was coming from. But then you had a whole group of VR guys going like, general AI is here. <laughs> yeah. It's... That's how thoughts get prolifera proliferated. Yeah, AI, AI is the buzzword of you know of right now, yeah. of, the, of maybe last year and maybe you know, a couple of years into the future, and that's and that's great. Um, I think there's a lot of applications um, for it, but you know, uh, really the thing that's making that happen nowadays is kind of the availability of general availability of processing sure. power and a lot of specialized hardware to do that stuff. So when you're when you're looking at this this software app. Um, what component to it is is AI or what is machine learning? Like, well, how do you how do you differentiate between what the product's doing and then bringing in other things? Are you writing that whole AI program within it, or are you kind of borrowing from other tools? Um, kind of borrowing from other tools. So yeah. some of the stuff that you know is that I guess we've learned, um, at least within the concept of industrial IoT, is. Uh, for example, cooler temperatures, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can we can look at a cooler temperature in uh, say over the past 24 hours and see kind of you know, where your defrost cycles are and what's the general um, health of the cooler. But th the thing is, is that uh, those don't necessarily take into account things like what's the external temperature, mm -hmm. right? So um, if you're my my dad's an HVAC guy or was an HVAC guy when he was in business and. Um, one of the things you always know is that when on the hottest day of the year, you have the most failures of coolers and any sort of chiller, that type of thing. This week's been rough <laughs> running a data center, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah, very familiar yeah. with that. Um, and so those metrics that you're so used to being stable, say, in the winter uh, for you know, your cooler now kind of just go all out of whack. And the, the question is, is, is that normal, right? Um, is that... Um, should we be sending out notifications that something's wrong with your cooler or is it just because it's hot outside? Um, and so what we're looking at doing is kind of taking all these data points that we've been able to collect with our industrial IoT system, right, um, and starting to try to pick out trends uh, using machine learning and basically saying, hey, is, is this normal operation of the cooler? Mm -hmm. Is this normal operation of the glycol unit? Um, and I think that's the important part because you can't just rely upon thresholds, right? Uh, sure, thresholds sure. don't take into account enough of other information that um, something like your general um, your general AI can. Right. And now, uh, as far as um, your data you're storing, is that is that build is that forever building? Basically, it collects all these data points. Then it's like, all right, for the last year, we know this to be true of your your beer line. You know, we're going to keep that because then we're going to have a five-year analytic report and so on and so forth. Exactly. That's something that um, I made a decision on very early is we want to just store all this yeah. data that we collect. Um, so temperatures, pressures, things like that. Because while it's not necessarily useful right now, um, down the road, uh, I think that being able to uh, find a good uh, you know, uh, data analyst, essentially, a mm -hmm. data scientist, um, bring out a good data scientist and basically sit them down in front sure. of years of data um, and then kind of turn them loose and let them try to pick out the different pieces. Um, I think that's really important. Well, then they could also build a more sophisticated product, right? They could be like, all right, well, these are the things we know that people don't pay attention to that are huge factors, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Did you think that you would uh, be working on a alcohol beer related project with IoT devices? Um, to tell you the truth, uh, <laughs> 
it wasn't that far out of the realm of possibility. Okay. Uh, one of the first things that we did with my um, my first company was we made a uh, an IoT uh, beer tap. Okay. Uh, so the idea being you could pay um, pay via your phone, and then uh, you see some of these places that have the self serve beer taps. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we basically developed a little unit that sat on top of the beer tap, um, pay by your phone, and then you could pour yourself a 22 ounce like metered glass of beer. Um, and so that was kind of our, one of our first uh, kind of fun projects okay. that we did with our IoT te IoT technology. So, so just as like a proof of concept, like hey, listen, here's a real world application. Exactly. Do you ever think you're going to return to some of those projects? Um, probably not that one because as part of that whole. Um, uh, I guess I IOTOS issue. Um, sure. That's actually now patented. Um, I'm an inventor on the patent. I own no rights to that patent. So I think we're going to leave that one. Okay. Leave that one alone. So what's the status <laughs> of IOTOS then? Uh, it's dissolved. It's dissolved, but yep. you still can't access its patents. Because um, I don't know how that works. So the patent the patent was transferred to a owner of mm, okay. IOTOS after I left. I see. Are they still working on that, or are they just letting they, the patent they, fall away? Well, they executed the patent. They yeah. continued the execution. It was provision, sure. provisional patent while we were there, Understood. while I was there. And then after I left, they fully executed it. Gotcha. So Maybe, yeah. When we see that going around, I'll be like, this was Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have a background in robotics, too, Yeah. right? Uh, can you give me a little bit on that? Sure. That was also super fascinating when we were chatting. Um, so I, I was... Looking back on it, it was probably a little bit too early on the whole robotics thing. Sure. Um, so in 2003, um, I was at RIT. Um, I did my I got my master's in computer engineering from RIT. But uh, 2003, I was a sophomore, and my uh, dad had found in a newspaper article uh, found a newspaper article about the DARPA Grand Challenge. Uh, this was the very first DARPA Grand Challenge, which uh, basically was. DARPA or Defense Advanced Research Projects Association. But um, before it was cool. Yeah, they were basically <laughs> saying, hey, um, we want to fund a million, million dollars to the first mm -hmm. team that can complete a uh, autonomous vehicle race course. Mm -hmm. And this is way before autonomous vehicles were a thing. Sure. Um, and so a uh, million dollars, first team that could do it. So I founded a team at RIT um, to try to compete in this challenge. So um, back in 2003, 2004, uh, we took a uh, 91 geo storm and <laughs> tore all of the interior out um, put actuators on steering brakes uh, throttle um, convinced some companies to give us very nice GPS systems and lidars and um, that's basically how I spent my my college <laughs> my college nights and weekends yeah um, kind of in a parking lot just playing around with this full-size car driving it around by yeah. itself yeah um, so that's how I got started in robotics. yeah yeah so and that that feeds into I mean how does that feed into IoT, right? Or at least in your specific situation? Um, you know, uh, being a computer engineer, um, RIT tended to focus their computer engineering curriculum on you know, processors, right? So um, their ideal case would have been that everyone who went through this pro program wound up working for AMD and Intel designing processors. I kind of took a different approach. I, I really like seeing things um, happen in the real world and I like being able to gather information about the real world and I like kind of where the real world intersects with electronics if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so robotics allowed me to kind of play around with taking electronics and making things happen in the real world mm -hmm. and IoT now is allowing me to um, kind of sense what's going on in the real world and get that into the electronic uh, you know, domain and do right. something interesting with it. Well, that kind of feeds into kind of your sentiments earlier about being a full stack developer being a little more than what the standard definition is, right? Yep. And so I guess with that kind of mentality, which, which I appreciate quite a bit, how do, you, how do you view the future of like just software developers in general? Because I'm seeing a lot of shifts in how people look at that, right? Mm -hmm. There's some that are, hey, I'm a, I only am trying to do blockchain software projects, you know, which is a whole subset. But there's all these weird specialists, but then there's also a lot of people that are working on kind of that firmware layer, just writing the bridge between hardware and software. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's going to be a bigger need for more people that are really crossing those barriers? Or do you think there's going to be more of a need for specialization? Um, I think that it really depends upon, uh, I guess, the, the person right um, and, and the application um, 
I think that there is definitely always going to be a need for specialization. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned before, you know, there are uh, engineers that are very, very much into one specific type of AI, say, yeah. you know, neural networks or adversarial neural networks, and that they're very, very good at that, but they don't care anything else about uh, genetic algorithms or you know, any of the other general AI stuff. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's an application for that. Um, there's a need for that, but there's also a need for kind of the jack of all trades that isn't necessarily deep in any given area, but understands how the, all these areas kind of um, interleave. Um, yeah. And so I think that going forward in the future, you're gonna need both of those, honestly. Sure, um, sure. Because uh, when you're down in the weeds, you're not seeing kind of the broader picture. And when you're, uh, I guess, uh, seeing the broader picture, you're not able to go down into the weeds, right? And so you need to have some interplay between all sure, of those. Sure, you have the guy at the 10 foot level and the guy at the 1,000 foot level. Yeah. yeah. I guess I, I, like, I like different perspectives. Um, as far as like just IIoT in general, mm -hmm. what do you think are going to be the next like major advancements? Like, what do you kind of since you're kind of more in it, you've been in it for a while. What do you think the next like step is? Do you think it's going to keep green gaining traction? Do you think it's going to feed into some other technologies? I think it's going to feed into AI. Honestly, yeah. um, I think that you know uh, I, I I guess if you think about um, you know a human right, uh, part mm -hmm. of uh, what makes art our intelligence up here is so great is the fact that we can gather data from our from our environment you know, visual visually we can um, pressure sensors uh, temperature sensors um, so I really think that I IOT or IOT is essentially creating the same concept right uh, you have this AI but you need to feed data to that AI so um, I IOT or IOT um, essentially takes data from the real world collects that and then is able to feed that up to um, that general AI that can then make decisions, um, specifically in the I IoT, industrial IoT um, area, um, can make decisions that can affect business processes and help save um, save companies money. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. So in the, in the buzzword bingo of 2019 between blockchain, IoT, and AI, AI is your favorite buzzword. Yeah, I think I think it has the the most application. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely I definitely get that, and I, I'm seeing AI kind of pop. You know, again, kind of feeding back just because it's still fresh <laughs> in my mind that uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, they're using a lot of um, neural networks really to mm -hmm. to test a lot of this stuff to to see how it's going to feel to to simulate some things. It's it's funny because. You know, and the, and the other side to that was they were all, all of their uh, business applications were run on the Unreal Red engine. Huh. So, like, uh, one of the examples was they had um, a car that somebody was working on. They put on their headset, their Google Glass or whatever. Or it wasn't a Google Glass, but it's a headset. Yeah. And they looked at it, and it was the car, but overlaid the car were, it were directions to fixing it. So you saw, like, oh, yeah. unscrew, unscrew, unscrew. You just, it's all there. But the underlying technology was uh, was a bunch of um, like predictive analytics to tell you what to do. Like it's just this flowchart. If this, then this. If this, then this. You know. And he went down, and I was like, oh, so this is almost like an AI course, right? Because mm -hmm. all the guys I was talking to that were presenting though were just the guys that were building out like the the user interface. But the underlying hardware was all just a bunch of AI guys. Hmm. So that was pretty. It was it was, it was a fascinating thing to kind of like look at, and I guess. You know, I was at a I was at a talk a while ago now, but it was scary with facial recognition. Oh so, yeah. Some of the things going on with that are just like, well, you know, but that's all deep fakes, which is another part of th that umbrella of AI. Right. Yep. You know, and it's kind of uh, it's absorbing everything, much like Columbus absorbed its neighboring suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in Cleveland, Cleveland to a you know, particular extent too. Yeah. Just for sure. Metro area of Cleveland is huge. <laughs> Yeah, it's slowly, slowly, more and more of those neighborhoods are uh, are being taken over. So when you look at um, you know this project, and I think that the other, and in all your projects, they've all had a kind of like a you start this, you go in, and then you, you phase out. You're working on some side projects mm -hmm. with your consulting. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I know you can't go into like the nuts and bolts of them, but on like a high level, what are some other things that you're working on? Sure. Um, so. Uh, we have a customer, um, they're a large local company, um, and they have developed a uh, robotic exoskeleton for mm -hmm. paraplegics. Uh, so essentially this is a, an exoskeleton that someone who has lost the uh, 
movement of their legs um, can strap on and it will actuate their hips, actuate their knees for them. Essentially, it gives them uh, the ability to get out of a wheelchair and actually start walking around. Uh, it's really, really cool technology. Um, they've been working on it for, for a long time um, and we've helped them uh, in terms of kind of the Bluetooth uh, implementation there as well as uh, writing a, an app that allows a therapist to actually control um, the different settings of that exoskeleton. For example, you know, how far forward the knee should go, how fast, things like that. Is that, <coughs> is that in like production? Are it is people, in production. People are walking around with that? Yeah, uh, in, in the U.S. as well as the, I think we have, I think we're up to like 14 different localizations for the app uh, because it's in so many countries. Sure. Uh, and that's that's for just legs, or is that also arms? Um, okay, just how, legs. How far? Okay, so it's just a, legs. Yeah, yeah it's a waist lower down. body yeah. exoskeleton. Interesting. Do you think that? Where do you think like exoskeletons are going to be? Do you think that's just like you know if, if somebody's body is just starting to give out, they're just going to start adding exoskeletons to them? Like, I mean, honestly, I, I, you're already starting to see sure. it. Um, I guess two different um, applications, right? The first application being for people who've lost the um, use of their their lower body, um, for example. Uh, the other application that you're seeing is to, um, I guess, either prevent um, damage. So you see this a lot in um, manufacturing facilities, uh, your different car, uh, car manufacturers and whatnot, where people will actually wear exoskeletons that prevent repetitive uh, use injuries. Um, okay. Things like things, uh, there are exoskeletons out there where literally someone can sit down while essentially standing and this exoskeleton kind of supports them. Um, and then the next thing, uh, the next application I think you'll see of exoskeletons is uh, augmentation. And there's a lot of research going on this in the military, uh, military aspect. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen like any of the videos of people. Like the super armor kind of things? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, essentially having people be, uh, or I guess soldiers be able to carry large amounts of weight over yeah. long distances, uh, essentially like a human forklift, right? Yeah. Um, so I think those are kind of the three uh, different aspects or applications of exoskeletons. And right now they're very much focused on the uh, more uh, therapeutic uh, applications. And if I wanted a suit that gave me extra arms that <laughs> were just mechanically coming out of like my spine kind or something like a Dr. Like Octopus, spider, right? Like a Dr. Octopus, we're pretty close to that. Um, and you can make that happen. I mean, arm wise, yeah, I think the biggest problem you have right now is how do you control those, right? Sure. And so that's where you start getting into some of the brain yeah. computer interface stuff. Um, and that's a contract job you're going to be taking soon? The brain computer interface <laughs> stuff? Uh, I... <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that would be, could be cool though. Yeah. But like, so, and, and this kind of feeds in, so you're, you're working on all these other projects. What is a project that you kind of have an idea for or that you want to work on? And you don't have to give them the nuts and bolts of it because yeah. we'll steal your secrets, obviously. <laughs> but like, but what's a problem you want to solve that you think you could? Um, so a real simple, simple problem, um, coffee. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of people who are very, very, very into their coffees. Uh, yeah. you know, they, um, they keep their water at a set temperature. Um, they control the uh, brew time, basically how, uh, how much time the coffee grounds are actually spent in contact with the water, uh, things like that. And so, um, one of the things that my, my wife's very into coffee. Uh, sure. So one of the things she's, that she's measuring the water temperature. Uh, she's not that okay. That crazy. It's but a, it's a scale. Talks to just, a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things I thought would just be interesting is making a very very um, kind of high end coffee pot that allows people to just tweak all of those mm -hmm. things to their liking. Okay. Um, and that's kind of again getting it back to the whole um, taking data out of the real world, doing something with it, but then actually being able to um, kind of actuate something in the real world, make something happen in the real world, and that would be coffee. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that, that's <laughs> definitely like an admirable goal to have too, right? Uh, and, I, and I definitely appreciate those kind of applications. Uh, you know, going back to, you know, not, uh, not disrespecting the startup community, but you go through a lot of ideas, and a lot of the ideas are good, but they aren't really bent around solving just a problem, and mm -hmm. not that coffee is this altruistic like problem that you're solving, but at least it's like, <clears throat> here's what it is, here's the function, this is why I'm doing it, mm -hmm. instead of, I'm doing this idea, I think it might take, but I want to be a successful startup entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think you see a lot of people out there who don't really care what they're working on. They just, they just want to have a startup. They want yeah. to um, be successful in the startup scene. and um, They want to be successful at being successful. Yes. Which is very, it's an interesting thing. I like being successful, or I, at least striving towards it. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Um, 
but I, I, I like being, uh, I, I guess, passionate about what I'm sure. what I'm working on, and not to say they're not passionate, but um, have some investment, I guess, in it. I don't know. Sure. Well, there, know. there's a technical part of that too, right? Being yeah. able to to balance being a technician, being kind of an inventor, and then also being able to market your product and also being willing to accept those accolades. Yeah. You know, uh, especially in like the cybersecurity world, there's a lot of people that talk about it on a very high level and there's a lot of people that used to be in the weeds and then talk about it on a high level and then there's just the people that have just always kind of been there and been like, you know, with their quips. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I definitely flirt with that line these days, uh, definitely more now than ever. But um, there's, a, there's just a lot of technicians though in cybersecurity particularly that I know that have invented great things or created wonderful things mm -hmm. and want none of the accolades. Right. And it's, it's this weird thing where I'm like, wow, I've never like not wanted to have like kudos, right? right, right. Like I, I, I don't just do it for kudos, but I've certainly never been like, you know, oh yeah, I'm just gonna make this, but give somebody else credit for it. Cause I don't want anyone to talk to me about it. Right, right, right. I mean, it's kind of the like engineer mind, sure. mindset, yeah. right? You see a lot of uh, engineers who just don't want that public spotlight. They just wanted to sit in a cubicle. My roommate in college, that was what he aspired to. He wanted to <laughs> just sit in a cubicle all day yeah. and just write code and not have to interact with anyone. Um, and that's fine. I mean, yeah. those people are, a lot of those people are brilliant, like you said. They yeah. come up with great ideas. But they, they sell themselves short very frequently. And, you know, like in, in, in one of my buddies that has developed something pretty um, pretty fantastic as far as uh, putting putting security measures on like quick mobile apps for mm -hmm. phones he, he just he just wanted to create and be done I'm like you could have definitely made a lot more money mm -hmm. with different people yeah. <laughs> you know and and so that's like that line and I guess where I'm going with this is so you've obviously flirted that line you're a technical person that uh, you know maybe it sounds like you went through your first startup and you were very much more looking at it from just the technical lens and that kind of opened your mind to looking at things from two viewpoints. Mm -hmm. What's your advice for somebody that's kind of in a similar spot? Um, like how did you overcome being just that technical guy? It's just realization, right? Um, like you said, when it comes down to it, you can work on something, you can develop something and that's great, but um, I've, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat these words, but I have uh, come to really appreciate uh, what good marketing uh, and sales, uh, a good salesperson can do, right? Um, just because you made something doesn't mean that anyone knows about it and doesn't mean that people know that they want it uh, or know that you know it can help them. And so being able to market that, um, figure out how to market it, where to market it, um, and then being able to sell that to somebody, that's a whole separate skill set that is completely different from the technical execution. and. Um, it's it's important yeah it's important and it pains me to say that as a very technical guy but it's a very important part of um, making making a successful product yeah you know and that ties into uh, I remember working with uh, some sales guys at Cisco and I found I just I gleaned how much percentage they were making on the overall deal mm -hmm. and I was my brain was just like how mm. how can you like give somebody this much of the why don't you just make the product cheaper like why why are you like the guy is just walking in and you know so, but that what I realize what goes into a sale and those just even just having that connection if you if you don't have someone on your team that has that connection to the person that's going to spend a lot of money on the product then yeah you know you can have the best product in the world and it doesn't matter which is a tough pill to swallow mm -hmm. it's just genuinely it's it's tough so I, I definitely. I definitely get that, but I remember the first time I heard like what sales guys were making. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'll still say I think I think it's probably a little more than they, they should be. They should be appreciated, sure, sure. but um, I don't know. A lot of the sales teams can sometimes be kind of like a you know boys club, very yeah. um, some I guess fraternity aspects to it. Um, There's definitely that that. Uh, there's a competition feel, and yeah. this is this is more from looking at how bigger sales teams are organized. At least in my in my situation, like I, I know, like I work for a mid-sized company now, but like, and our our our, our staff's not quite like that. But <laughs> and when you have a robust sales team and you're pitting guys against each other and you're doing like these weird monthly goals or monthly competitions, or you know, we'll give you a fifty dollar Amazon card if you do this, and we'll put your name on the wall and say you're better than the other ones. Yeah. That really creates that, that drives that, that weird culture yeah. that I think is very alien 
to the people that are on the far technical side, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. On the far technical side, at least what I'm I'm used to is definitely more of a collaborative culture, and like not competitive, uh, not competitive yeah. at all. Um, How do we make this thing work? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I feel really feel like you know on the sales side, it it helps to be a competitive. It's just a different personality. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You know, in my experience, of that was I was a, I was the sales engineer for one of the sales guys. I was walking around just watching him like. Well, that guy better not get this deal. This is my deal. I'm like, <laughs> I thought these were mapped out by territory. He's yeah, like, yeah. that's my name to count. And I'm like, okay, this is just different, right? And yeah. then, uh, obviously, and again, you know, I I had to adapt to kind of play both sides of that now. Uh, you know, and there's in weird ways too. You know, even with like the podcast, you have to you have to sell people on watching it or sell people on coming on and talk to people about it. Not that anyone's really exchanging money there, but it's it's still a, it's still like a weird you have to be a lot more sociable and you have to understand that there's like these weird value propositions, mm -hmm. which coming from like a technical aspect, I don't know that I, I don't know if I always had the full uh, appreciation of that, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And it's something that as you're exposed to it more, yeah. you, you begin to appreciate yeah. it. And then eventually I'll just walk around just being this guy shaking people's hands like, hi, <laughs> I know nothing anymore. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like when I was younger, everyone was like, I have all these Novell certs, you know, you don't know what life's about until you have all these Novell certs, you know, like this is, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, I got a bunch of Cisco certs and now I very much feel like that's, it's, it's come full circle where I'm just like, well, you know, when I got my A plus, it was a permanent thing, you know, right. my network plus is permanent. You have to renew yours every three years. So I'm clearly better that I have old <laughs> information that's still credible. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah, just a different, just a different weird like tech culture thing. Uh, that was a weird tangent that I didn't expect to get on, Thank but you. I appreciate where that went. Um, uh, I guess kind of closing, closing this one out. Um, what what do you want out of like the next five years of your technical career? The next five years of my technical career, um, or your professional career, however you want to put it. Honestly, um, like, like you said, everyone wants to be successful, right? Sure. Um, well, how do you measure success? How do you, how do you measure success? Um, I think one of the things that we're kind of beginning to focus on is um, how can we make our customers more successful, right? Um, that's kind of one of the tenets of industrial IoT, um, especially kind of in Cleveland in the, in the Rust Belt, is how can we take some of this technology um, put that into some of these kind of aging manufacturers that are in this area to make them more competitive in today's market. Um, so, for example, uh, we work with a glass company, uh, or I guess not really a glass company, it's a company that makes um, devices that are used in the manufacture of glass and glass doors, things like that. And so uh, we were able to develop some hardware for them that would go into their product which is then used at your um, different glass manufacturers. Um, and they can get data back out of their product, things like uh, how much uptime does this thing have, how many errors are occurring, um, things like that. Um, and so that can then feed into, I guess, their um, analysis of how well their machines are working in the field, help them increase the uptime of their machines and make them more successful. And you know, there, are, there are large companies out there right now that are doing similar things. Um, I mean, your, all of your um, varying like Siemens and uh, um, of the world. I'm trying to think of what the other one is. It's a uh, local. It's not Johnson Controls. No, uh, Rockwell. Rockwell Automation. Yeah, Rockwell. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they're they're all doing very similar things, mm -hmm. um, but the the cost of their systems is just astronomical, and so um, it's out of reach of a lot of the smaller companies that are out there. You mean it's out of reach for like local companies? Yeah. It's like in the local company. That makes I sense. Mean, yeah. Think about driving down, um, you know, driving up to or driving down 77 or mm -hmm. 71. How many um, small little buildings by the side of the freeway do you see that are just like local companies that are making some product and they're being successful at it, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but they're typically, they're not up on technology essentially. Well, they're also not in a position to expand. Right. Yeah. So, so like, are you familiar with Team Neo at all? Yeah. Yeah. So they have a big manufacturing initiative. They have a couple like smart uh, manufacturing clusters. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the observations somebody made at a recent cluster meeting was, you have a lot of these like real nice small niche. You know, I make this bearing, or I make this. You know, I make this thing. They're just not interested really in. Um, 
in buying more plants and expanding in the, mm -hmm. sa in the same way. I'm sure that, yeah, if, if given the opportunity, they would absolutely do that. Mm -hmm. But they don't have that, that like, like, mindset that most corporations have where it's like every year we have to have 50 percent growth or yeah. you know we're going to shoot real high they're all just trying to maintain at least in this section of the rust belt mm -hmm. um so i think that that also feeds into it though I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with just trying to maintain i mean i think that continual growth is something that's just hard to achieve right mm -hmm. yeah um and when it comes down to it these small companies that are just trying to maintain they're just trying to exist aren't bad places to work they pay no, their employees yeah. well they take and care so of themselves. if we yeah. can if we can help them <laughs> oh. come on larry <laughs> Um, I, I think that if we can help them um, just maintain and exist in today's you know competitive ever more competitive market, that's that's fine by me. Um, yeah, that's kind of a, kind of one of our goals. And that's 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 something that you're working towards today, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, no. Like I said, I like all the things you're about. I'm real happy that Adam connected us. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything you wanted to plug? Not particularly. I'm not, I'm not really here to plug anything. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, check out Breakwall Analytics. You know, if you uh, if you have a beer line that needs cleaned, you know, it's a conversation perhaps worth having. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome, sir. Thank you. Yeah.